My name is Tia Gordon, and I will be presenting on aortic stenosis. I have no disclosures. Our overview today will be to go over normal aortic valve structure and physiology, aortic stenosis etiology and pathophysiology, the qualitative and quantitative assessment of aortic stenosis on echo, obtaining measurements, and a case study. Of the right, left, and non-coronary cusps, the cusps are thin and pliable and is responsible for regulating blood flow from the left ventricle to the rest of the body. Aortic stenosis is the narrowing of aortic valve opening, increasing resistance of the blood to flow from the left ventricle to the aorta. It is the most common heart disease in the geriatric, geriatric population. There are several etiologies, including degenerative calcification, congenital malformation, and post-inflammatory processes. Degenerative calcification is the most common etiology of aortic stenosis after the age of 65, affecting men more than women. The valve is usually tricuspid, though it may be challenging to determine the number of cusps on echo due to shadowing artifact from the calcification. Congenital aortic stenosis is often due to an abnormal number of cusps, most commonly bicuspid. Because these valves are abnormal, they are prone to calcification, and due to their already narrowed orifice area, only a small amount of calcification can create significant stenosis. Another congenital malformation is when a membrane grows across the left ventricular outflow tract, creating subvalvular aortic stenosis. In these patients, their aortic valve may look completely normal, but with but will have increased flow velocities in the outflow tract. That's why it's important to look at valve morphology. If the valve looks normal, there is increased flow velocities. Take a closer look at the LVOT. Here is an example of a typical bicuspid valve with fusion of the right and left cusps. Over time, the valve can accumulate calcification, causing stenosis. Again, it may be difficult to determine the number of cusps due to the calcification. When looking at a, a calcified stenotic aortic valve, you should have a high index of suspicion for a bicuspid valve, even in patients above the age of 65. Here is a case of subvalvular membrane. The aortic valve looks completely normal, tri-leaflet with thin, pliable cusps, but in the apical 5 chamber, we see some aliasing in the left ventricular outflow tract. On spectral Doppler, there is a peak velocity of nearly 3 meters per second, and in the LVOT, there are significantly increased flow velocities. Looking closer at the LVOT, we can see a small mobile membrane. Post-inflammatory diseases can also cause aortic stenosis. Rheumatic fever is an inflammatory disease that can develop as a complication of inadequately treated strep throat or scarlet fever, typically affecting children and young adults. However, it's rarely seen in the United States today. Other types of post-inflammatory diseases include patients who have been exposed to radiation on their chest, those who have a history of endocarditis, and a patient, a patients who have taken medication known to cause stenosis. Uh, medications like ergotamine that used to be prescribed for migraines. More recently, fenfen was thought to cause babulopathy, though it's been controversial. This is an example of rheumatic aortic valve. On ultrasound, there is increased echogenicity along the leaflet edges and fusion of the aortic valve commissures. Due to increased resistance, the LV works harder to meet metabolic needs, over time causing left ventricular hypertrophy. This progresses to decreased LV compliance, causing elevated left end diastolic pressures, leading to left atrial enlargement and eventually heart failure. Thickened myocardium requires increased blood supply from coronary arteries. Blood supply becomes inefficient, resulting in angina and potentially myocardial ischemia. If the heart is unable to eject enough blood to meet the metabolic needs of the body, it can lead to syncope, cerebral infarct, and even death. Looking qualitatively at aortic stenosis on echo, we find a chunky aortic valve with decreased excursion of the cusps left ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement, and many times there may be additional calcification on the annulus of the mitral valve. To interrogate the morphology of the aortic valve, the peristernal long and short axis are the best views. Peristernal long axis may demonstrate an asymmetrical closure line, 
typically found in bicuspid aortic valves or systolic doming indicative of aortic stenosis. The stored axis is, best view, is the best view to determine the number of cusps and the severity and location of any calcification or thickening of the valve. When evaluating the number of cusps, it's important to look at the aortic valve in systole to determine if the valve is bicuspid or tricuspid. If it is bicuspid, seeing the valve on FOSS allows you to determine which cusps are fused. Here is an example of a bicuspid aortic valve with a RAFE, or underdeveloped aortic valve cusp. In this case, the left coronary cusp is underdeveloped and fused with the right cusp. When the valve is closed in diastole, it looks similar to a tricuspid valve. However, when the valve is open in systole, it clearly shows the football-shaped opening and fusion of the right and left cusps. Moving on to quantifying the severity of aortic stenosis. This is the criteria from the American Society of Echocardiography in determining the severity of aortic stenosis. The peak velocity, peak gradient, and mean gradient all come from measuring the velocity time integral of the highest velocity across the aortic valve. The aortic valve area and dimensionless index can be calculated with just a few additional measurements. To calculate the dimensionless index, which is essentially a ratio, simply divide the velocity time integral of the LVOT with the VTI of the aortic valve. You can also use velocity, though it is less preferred. If the ratio is under 5, or under 0.5, there is stenosis. If it's less than 0.25, it's severe aortic stenosis. It's a very simple calculation to get a quick assessment on the severity of stenosis. Next, the aortic valve area is calculated using the continuity equation, which follows the law of conservation. Basically, what goes in must go out. Therefore, the stroke volume of the LVOT and the stroke volume of the aortic valve should be the same. So by calculating the stroke volume of the LVOT and the maximum flow velocity going through the aortic valve, we can determine the aortic valve area. This is the continuity equation to calculate the aortic valve area. Only three measurements are needed. The LVOT diameter, the LVOT VTI, and the aortic valve VTI. The cross-sectional area is calculated by pi radius squared. Um, we get the radius by dividing the diameter by 2. Multiply it by the VTI of the LVOT and divide that by the aortic valve VTI. If it calculates to less than 1.5 centimeters squared, there is AS. If it's less than one centimeter squared, then there is severe AS. First, let's talk about the 2D measurements, in particular the LVOT. The LVOT diameter should be measured in zoom with optimized image settings to clearly define the left ventricular outflow tract. Measure the diameter with inner edge to inner edge technique and the caliper should be five to 10 millimeters below the aortic annulus. Additionally, it may help to do a lateral to medial sweep through the valve to make sure the widest diameter is measured. At the bottom of the screen is an example of measuring the widest diameter of the circle. However, if you aren't in the correct window and are foreshortening the LVOT, your widest diameter could be shortchanged. The reason why this particular measurement is so critical is because it's in the continuity equation, the diameter is squared. Let's say, for example, we have one patient and three sonographers. One sonographer measures the LVOT diameter at 2.2 centimeters. Plug that into the cross-sectional area calculation and we get 3.8 centimeters squared. The next sonographer measures the LVOT at 2 centimeters, giving a cross-sectional area of 3.1 centimeters squared. The third sonographer measures at 1.8 centimeters for a cross-sectional area of 2.5 centimeters squared. So we get it. We go from a difference of just 4 millimeters to 1.3 centimeters squared. Now 1.3 doesn't sound like too much of a difference, but if we plug it into the rest of the equation, you can really see a difference in the valve areas. So again, we have our three sonographers with their difference, different LVOT diameters. We'll pretend they measure the exact same LVOT VTI of 25 centimeters and aortic valve VTI of 65 centimeters. Using the rest of the calculation, the first sonographer calculates an aortic valve area of 1.5 centimeters squared. Sonographer 2, an aortic valve area of 1.2 centimeters squared. And sonographer 3, an aortic valve area of 0 0.9 centimeters squared. If we look back at the guidelines for aortic valve area, this patient can have anywhere from mild to severe aortic stenosis. That's the difference of 4 millimeters. Let's talk a little more about obtaining these measurements with the ultrasound. 
first we'll start with continuous wave Doppler. Continuous wave Doppler is where the transducer uses two piezoelectric crystals, one that is constantly emitting pulses, another that is constantly listening for the return signals. This allows the machine to record the highest velocities without aliasing. As a sonographer, it's important to keep the angle of your cursor as parallel to flow as possible. Poor Doppler angles can underestimate the peak velocity. The velocities can be interrogated in the apical 5 and 3 chambers. Due to the importance of being parallel to flow, the non-imaging transducer should be used in patients who have an aortic prosthesis, who have higher flow velocities, or who have a thickened and calcified valve. The typical windows used for non-imaging transducer include the apical window, the suprasternal notch, and the right sternal border. Additional windows to use for the non-imaging transducer include the right supraclavicular, where you place the probe to the right of the patient's neck. Many times you might find flow of the SBC. Luckily, the aortic valve is just to the left, so between sliding or angling the transducer, you'll be able to find the velocity. Another view is the subcostal window. For this one, it can be very challenging to find and may need to use additional pressure for proper angulation. The narrow opening of the aortic valve creates a smaller jet to find, and it's not always in the center of the valve. It helps to use some off-axis imaging to really find the highest velocities, so be adventurous and think outside the box with positioning and angulation of the non-imaging transducer. Here is an example of a sonographer using the subcostal short axis view to Doppler the aortic valve to obtain the highest velocity. That is thinking outside the box. Again, obtaining the highest flow velocity is important. This will calculate the peak velocity, peak gradient, and mean gradient, as well as the velocity time integral. If it's very challenging to find the velocity using an imaging, um, using an imaging enhancer may help to bring out the signal. Though a word of caution, it, to not measure feathering in the Doppler signal and to optimize your spectral Doppler display. One is because it will make the patient's pathology worse and possibly send them to surgery before they need it. The second reason, these patients are typically followed closely with serial echoes, so the next sonographer is going to be pulling their hair out to try and match a false measurement. Last thing to keep in mind with using continuous wave Doppler, especially with a non-imaging probe. If the patient has mitral regurgitation in addition to their, their aortic stenosis, be careful not to mix up the two signals. Both occur in systole and flow in the same direction. To differentiate, it may be helpful to measure the ejection time. The aortic velocity will have a shorter ejection time than the mitral regurgitation because mitral regurgitation occurs during isovolumic contraction time, systole, and isovolumic relaxation time until the mitral valve opens. AS only occurs during systole. Additionally, look at the shape of the waveform. Mitral regurgitation has a parabolic flow profile, whereas AS looks more triangular. And patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will have a late peaking dagger shaped waveform. All are very different pathologies and should not be confused with one another. The final important parameter is the pulse wave Doppler assessment. For an accurate cross-sectional area calculation, the velocity of the LVOT should be sampled from where the LVOT diameter was measured. This can be a bit difficult because the measurement is made in the parasternal long axis and the LVOT velocity is sampled in the apical five or three chambers. So as a guide, it may be helpful to place the sample volume at the aortic valve and move it apically until there is no more aliasing. A great indicator for a good pulse wave sample volume placement is if there is a closing click on the spectral waveform. However, for patients with aortic stenosis, the flow velocities near the aortic valve tend to be increased, so the sample volume may have to be moved slightly more apically to minimize falsely increased flow velocities. So how can you tell if your pulse wave sample is too close to the aortic valve? If you have a high velocity across the aortic valve, but a large aortic valve area, your pulse wave sample may be too close to the aortic valve. Some things to check on your echo is the accuracy of the LVOT diameter. Another is to look at the overall hemodynamics of the patient. Was there significant aortic regurgitation, or is the patient in a high output state? If none applies, the pulse wave sample is too close. Patients where you might get a higher flow of velocity but relatively normal aortic valve area may be in a high output state. Is your patient obese or pregnant? Do they have kidney or liver disease? These can lead to falsely increased flow of velocities. On the other hand, what about if your pulse wave sample is too far from the aortic valve? 
If you have a lower velocity across the aortic valve, but a small aortic valve area, your pulse wave sample may not be close enough to the aortic valve. Still check your LVOT diameter, or again, look at the hemodynamics of the patient. Are they in a low output state? Patients in low output states include those with poor left ventricular systolic function, a small cardiac chamber, or if they have mitral valve disease. If none apply, your pulse wave sample is too far from the aortic valve. Another tool is to calculate the stroke volume and cardiac output. The good news to figuring out a patient's stroke volume is the work is mostly done if you've already calculated the aortic valve area. Stroke volume is simply the cross-sectional area multiplied by the LVOT velocity time integral. A good practice would be to compare your Doppler-derived stroke volume with the biplane stroke volume where you subtract the end diastolic volume from the end systolic volume. It's rare these will be the same, however, they should be in the same ballpark. To calculate cardiac output, simply multiply the stroke volume by the patient's heart rate. According to the American Society of Echocardiography, these are the normal values for stroke volume and cardiac output. If your patient has a cardiac output greater than 8 liters per minute, they are considered to be in a high flow state. If the patient is in a low output state, their stroke volume index, where you take the calculated stroke volume and divide it by the patient's BSA, you would, um, would be less than 35 milliliters per meter squared. It's a lot of math, but putting it into context with the case study may help make more sense. So here is a patient with an LVOT diameter of 1.9 centimeters in a bicuspid aortic valve. Looking at the aortic waveform alone, we get a peak velocity of 3.7, peak gradient of 53 millimeters of mercury, and a mean gradient of 23 millimeters of mercury, all suggesting there is moderate aortic stenosis. Let's dig a little deeper. We've measured the, an LVOT VTI of 14.7 and therefore can calculate the aortic valve area, dimensionless index, and stroke volume. So let's put it together. Let's start with dimensionless index. We will simply take the ratio of the LVOT VTI and aortic valve VTI. It's essentially the continuity equation without the worry of the LVOT diameter. We get a ratio of 14.7 over 73.5 and our dimensionless index is 0.2. This is consistent with severe aortic stenosis. Let's look at aortic valve area. We'll take the cross-sectional area of the LVOT, which is 2.8, multiply that by 14.7, the LVOT VTI, and we get 41.6. We divide that by the aortic valve VTI of 73.5 and get an aortic valve area of 0 0.57, again consistent with severe aortic stenosis. So we seem to have discrepant values. The velocity and gradients across the aortic valve suggest only moderate stenosis, while the aortic valve area and dimensionless index suggest severe aortic stenosis. Why would we have these dis discrepancies? Let's look at the patient's stroke volume to see if we can determine the patient's flow state. To get the stroke volume, we'll multiply the cross-sectional area of 2.8 and multiply it by 14.7 we get a stroke volume of 41.6, which is below the normal range. We can even take it a step further and calculate the stroke volume index. We'll take the patient's stroke volume and divide it by their body surface area, and we get it 26, which is below the cutoff, and the patient is considered to be in a low flow state. So what may cause a patient to be in a low flow state? Here is the apical four chamber apical four and two chamber views of the patient. The patient's ejection fraction is severely depressed, therefore causing the low flow state. So what do we go by the velocities or the aortic valve area and dimensionless index? Because the flow through the aorta is dependent on the flow state of the patient, it's more accurate to follow the aortic valve area and dimensionless index calculations. There are four types of aortic stenosis. The usual one with, we think of is the normal flow high gradient aortic stenosis. We just reviewed a case that was a patient with low flow high gradient aortic stenosis. There's also low flow low gradient aortic stenosis where the patient is in a low flow state and they have low flow velocities. Essentially the ventricle cannot produce enough force to cause severe AS. And finally the normal flow low gradient AS where the patient is in a normal flow state but does not have high flow velocities. Some take-home points on aortic stenosis are to carefully interrogate the aortic valve morphology and look for supporting evidence of aortic stenosis on echo.
Remember the values and important equations used to determine aortic stenosis severity. Be adventurous with that, the non-imaging transducer to find the highest velocity across the aortic valve. Check to make sure if your measurements make sense. If not, if not, look at the bigger picture. What else is going on with the patient? Lastly, I wanted to emphasize the importance of the echo exam to properly interrogate aortic stenosis. Echo is the standard for aortic stenosis evaluation over cardiac cath. Therefore, we play a major role in deciding if these patients go to surgery. Thank you.